The Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Blockchain Super Conference is coming to Dallas, Texas, February 16, 17, and 18 in 2018. If you know of a better way to get the latest insider knowledge about crypto, to hear directly from the top minds in this field, to interact personally with 800 fellow crypto lovers, hodlers, investors, miners, traders, developers, and founders, then I'd like to hear about it. If you don't, then you don't want to miss out. Register today for the Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Blockchain Super Conference. Go to BitcoinSuperConference.com and register today as a super early bird to get the lowest rates on tickets and hotel rooms. That's BitcoinSuperConference.com. Welcome to Almost Here, Round the Corner of Future Technology podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies poised to transform our lives for better or worse are the focus of this podcast. Almost Here means these technologies are now here and starting to be used or just around the corner from Bitcoin to artificial intelligence, 3D printing, blockchain, virtual reality, and more. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with Future Tech Podcast. I have uh, two guests. Alex Miller and Carl Kreider, uh, co-founders of Grid Plus. How are you guys doing? Doing pretty well. Thanks for having us. Doing yeah. well, yeah. Thanks for having us. Yeah, no problem. No problem. I know uh, Carl's traveling in Europe and you guys are out and about, you know, promoting and working on things. Um, tell listeners uh, the basics. What's Grid Plus about? Um, I guess I'll take that one. So um, Grid Plus is uh, basically... Uh, bringing blockchain uh, to electricity markets uh, to try to make them more efficient, uh, to lower costs, and to help uh, create sort of the transactional infrastructure uh, needed to efficiently uh, bring on uh, more renewable energy and distributed energy resources uh, to the grid in the future. Yeah, I remember, um, well, now it's probably like 12 years ago with Enron, in the you know in the U.S., they were uh, messing around with the cost of energy, and they drove up prices like crazy. And uh, you know, I I would hope that the market's become a lot more efficient since then, and uh, that you guys are going to play a big role in that. What, what do you see as the current state of the uh, the market? You know, in terms of energy, what does it look like? You know, what are the problems with it that you want to solve? So, if you look at the uh, deregulation of energy market, uh, Texas. Is probably the the best example of uh, successful deregulation. Uh, your allusion to Enron uh, and what happened there in California is probably the the worst example of of what happened with deregulation. Uh, but what we see in Texas is we've actually had a system uh, developed that's highly efficient, where you have uh, competitive generation, you have competitive retailing. And we've also seen uh, a lot of adoption of uh, renewable resources. Uh, In Texas specifically, that's wind. On some days in Texas, uh, wind production can make up uh, 45% of the the total uh, energy production in the state. So so it's actually worked out pretty well uh, for Texas. And the biggest sort of point of inefficiency that still exists in the marketplace is kind of on the retailing side. Um, so in Texas, uh, about uh, 85% of the households have access to something called uh, competitive uh, uh, retailing. So they can choose uh, from a number of companies who they want to actually purchase their electricity from. And these retailers end up charging customers about 100% markup over the actual cost of the electricity and the uh, charges for distribution of that electricity. And so that 100% markup is the, the biggest inefficiency uh, that still sort of remains in deregulated energy markets. So all right, when you're talking about retail, is that just me as a customer buying electricity from my local provider, or is this business retail? I mean, you know, where is the focus here? So when when we talk about a retailer in Texas, uh, a customer may think about a retailer as uh, their utility. So the the technical reference is a retail electricity provider, uh, but what they do in the system is they're actually just sort of a financial intermediary. They don't typically produce energy. They're not responsible for maintaining any sort of infrastructure or wires or uh, transmission systems. They're only responsible for essentially buying energy out of these wholesale markets and then uh, packaging it and selling uh, to consumers. 
So, uh, for example, mm-hmm. if you're in Texas, you, your utility, as you might think of it, uh, could be like a Reliant or a Green Mountain Energy, and those are what we refer to as as the retailers. Okay, so they don't really seem to have – they don't seem to be bringing any value to the ecosystem yet. They're marking stuff up 100% in some cases. Yeah, so, so what ends up happening is because they're not sort of bringing value and they're offering um, – a non-differentiable product in a competitive space, a lot of the money they spend and what that markup goes to uh, can kind of be broken down into into three different pieces. So uh, one piece is amateurizing bad debts of non-paying customers across the rest of the customer base. And that can cost the retailers about 25% of their margin or their markup. Uh, Another 25% of the margin our markup goes to uh, paying for administrative costs, you know, signing people up, uh, kind of doing things with hedging energy prices and billing and administration. And then half of their money uh, goes to marketing. So in Texas, because of this sort of non-differentiated product offering, the customer churn for the average retailer is about 30% of their customers will change per year. So they spend a tremendous amount of money uh, marketing, just trying to acquire new customers to uh, maintain their their customer base at a consistent level from year to year. Mm, okay. So how and are you so, going to make things uh, more efficient? What's what's the solution to all this? So so if you look at what we're trying to do, um, is we're trying to use blockchain as a mechanism for settlement, such that the customers of Grid Plus. Uh, which is a a retail electricity provider that we're starting uh, in the state of Texas, and we're going to start taking customers in uh, Q2 of next year. All of our customers will be able to uh, pay for their electricity in real time, and the settlement mechanism for doing that will be a blockchain-based system. Because our customers can pay for their electricity in real time, we don't have to deal with this idea or costs associated with bad debts. Uh, so that we can pretty much eliminate that 25% out of the price stack. We also think that we can eliminate about half of the administrative costs. Uh, so right there, we've eliminated uh, roughly 30, say 7% of, of that markup. Once we do that, we have a, a cost competitive advantage. And we then believe that that will allow us to spend uh, significantly less money on marketing. Overall, uh, we anticipate that we can reduce the price of electricity for a residential customer in Texas by 35 to 40%. So how will you allow people to pay in real time? That sounds like this huge savings. Um, right now, I guess people still have to come out and read the meter, right? Yeah, uh, so, so, so in tech... Go ahead, Alex. Yeah, so um, as far as, as like the Oracle data, that's still going to be the smart meter. Um, that infrastructure is already set up. So we um, traditional re- utilities and retailers um, use use really the the same protocol that we will use. So so basically, a house has a smart meter installed. Um, it reads its okay. net meter, so like the total amount that they've drawn in from the grid, um, or in some cases that they've put out into the grid. They just read the the net influx or efflux of of um, electricity over some time period. They, the, the smart meter then sends that data to the independent um, systems operator for the region. And, and in Texas, that, that entity is called ERCOT. It's a nonprofit. Um, basically, when, when a customer signs up for, for a utility, um, be it like Grid Plus or maybe someone else, that, that utility can query that, uh, that ISO for the electricity that has been consumed um, via, via the ISO. Um, the, the, and that, that electricity will have been sent, or sorry, that, that reading will have been sent by the smart meter. Um, the, the way our system works is that a customer would prepay for energy with something like a credit card, um, maybe a, a fiat like um, bank transfer, a wire transfer. Okay. And they would, we would create um, a number of fiat tokens, so price stable USD tokens. Uh, we call them bolts in our system. And we would then send those to the customer's agent. That's that's a smart device that that we manufacture that we have shipped to them. Um, it's basically an always-on cryptocurrency wallet with a secure enclave. Um, it would then 
be able to pay for those bills in real time. So it has this cryptocurrency um, inside of a, well, associated with a private key that's stored inside of a secure enclave. Um, it okay. has a payment channel open with us, um, and that's using the, the, the Raiden network, which is built on top of Ethereum. And it's mm -hmm. able to query us for, for that information um, every 15 minutes. So its smart meter will, will have pushed some data to the ISO. We will have pulled it. We will have multiplied that by the price of the electricity at that, that point in time. And then we will basically generate a bill for, for that customer. Um, their smart agent will query for that bill, get the amount, and then it will sign, a, uh, it will cryptographically sign a message with its private key, pledging to basically send us that money over um, the, the Raiden state channel. Um, and that basically just happens every 15 minutes um, for as long as they are our customer. Okay. Um, what percentage of people in Texas, you know, which sounds like where you're starting off, uh, have a smart meter versus an old school meter? And how much does it cost um, to retrofit? It's pretty close yeah, to 100%. So, so, yeah, in Texas, it's a uh, 100% penetration of smart meters. Texas is somewhat unique um, in that way. There, there are a number of smart meters in markets that have high penetration of smart meters. Uh, in the country now, there's about, I think, 40 to 50 million smart meters uh, currently installed. Uh, but because Texas has 100% smart meter penetration, as well as having very uh, sort of amiable uh, uh, regulations and uh, a competitive deregulated market. That's the reason that we're initially starting uh, in the Texas market. Any, um, you know, do people, all right, so, you know, someone would set up a reserve and it would draw down that reserve of money as they use electricity. So you don't have people paying or being billed like every 15 minutes every day. That seems like it would drive people crazy. Yeah, so yeah, from so the customer standpoint, right, they're uh, essentially putting money uh, into the agent, and then that money is getting drawn down over time, uh, rather than having the traditional model where they consume electricity on a credit basis and then settle um, at the end of the month. So the the mechanism of the actual payments that are happening every 15 minutes are dealt with strictly by the agent. Uh, so the customer doesn't have to uh, actually think about that. They just have to periodically sort of add funds, kind of like they would periodically uh, pay their electricity bill. Right. What about, um, you know, I know it's probably not your bailiwick and stuff, but, you know, if a customer doesn't pay, do they get cut off a lot faster than under the traditional model? Is there any downside to doing things this way from the customer's perspective or anyone else's perspective? So, there's uh, consumer regulation uh, protections and uh, laws that uh, have to be uh, respected and for uh, an electricity retailer uh, in the market. And so in Texas, there's a requirement that the retailer gives uh, 10 days notice uh, prior to cutting off a customer. And so mm -hmm. to deal with that, as well as... Um, essentially issues that may arise with uh, dropping out in or intermittency and in connectivity, uh, the customers, when they sign up, will also have to uh, uh, sign up with a small deposit amount. So if hmm. the internet connectivity is lost or the agent goes down for some reason, uh, or they just run out of funds and decide to stop paying their bills, uh, the deposit will get drawn down upon and that will uh, give adequate amounts of time for us to then send a notice, uh, give them 10 days, and be compliant with uh, all the regulations without actually taking on a significant risk of a bad debt prior to uh, shutting off electricity. Yeah, because that turns this from a credit situation to uh, you know, a, a pay-as-you-go pay and pay-up-front situation. So I see it would be a big game-changer for the uh, you know, the electric companies and for consumers and for everybody. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, that's, that's kind of our stated goal in terms of being able to do this. Yeah, and for everybody. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, that's, that's kind of our stage one, uh, so to speak, is, is we're essentially introducing this idea of, of pay-as-you-go uh, electricity to the U.S. markets. There's, there's some interesting uh, sort of features that we're also adding initially. So, uh, one of the things that a typical retail energy provider does is they have uh, this idea of flat rate pricing. So, when you buy electricity, you'll pay, you know, 11, 
sense in Texas, and it doesn't matter what time of day uh, you're actually consuming. Even though the wholesale markets or the actual price of electricity can vary widely throughout the day, uh, you can see, you know, at nighttime it can be a penny, maybe two pennies, and then during peak times it could go four or five, six x uh, that price. And so what that does, though, is it creates a system where although there are changes in supply and demand that are reflected in the price, the consumer uh, isn't exposed to those, so they have no incentive to uh, consume when there's an abundance or to curtail consumption uh, when prices are high. But what the smart energy agent uh, can do is it can act as a gateway to allow the customer to understand the prices and then the agent can make decisions about consumption on the customer's behalf based off those prices. And so you're actually creating a, a responsive system to uh, the market, which actually helps the grid um, become more stable and more efficient and get better utilization of existing infrastructure. Interesting. Okay. Do you, have you have you trialed this yet? Is it uh, in action in Texas or anywhere? Are, you, are customers using it yet? Alex, uh, you want to take that one? Yeah. Yep. So we um, we ran a POC as part of a client engagement earlier this year. Um, that was a previous iteration um, relative to what we have now. So what we what we want to do now um, that that was a very limited trial. And it was kind of in a different scope than this. Um, we are working on um, we 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 have a we have like a, a demo that that can be sort of done virtually, but we haven't deployed um, any hardware yet. We're looking to do that in Q2 when, when we sign up um, our first customers as part of our Texas utility. Um, so that that's looking like our first kind of deployment date, and we want to target somewhere around five thousand customers for that. Oh, cool. So It'll to, be interesting to see what behaviors there are. Good. Yeah, so to kind of elaborate on that a little bit more, uh, so so we've demonstrated a lot of the uh, software sort of capabilities of the system in a uh, sort of the proof of concept sort of limited uh, scale environment. In terms of actually being able to do it on a broad scale and with open market participation, we have to go through the process of essentially registering uh, and getting approval as a retail electricity provider in the state of Texas. And then we also are in the process of taking uh, essentially what is prototype hardware and uh, creating production uh, uh, hardware, which we can actually deploy at scale. So those two things are in the process of happening, uh, and those should be done, uh, like Alex said, by Q2 of next year. What about... Um you know, if people are, want to sell electricity back to the grid or they want to do a local grid in their area, does your system accommodate any of that stuff or is that kind of totally separate? Yeah, so so we do. Um, wh- one thing that kind of sets us apart from a lot of other projects in the blockchain space that are doing energy is that we really believe in using the existing grid. So this is um, this is this really reliable network, at least in the U.S., Um, that doesn't go down a lot. Uh, There is a lot of strain on it, but we are all connected to it. And it's this really, really large piece of infrastructure that um, is is for the most part reliable. So what we want to do is really augment that grid with additional resources that that can kind of boost the capacity of it over time. So what we're designing our system to do is by opening these markets, like Carl was talking about, by opening the pricing, we think that this will incentivize people to purchase solar panels and batteries. And that comes from the fact that um, the open pricing is sort of the, the same. It's still exposed to market fluctuations on the production side. So when you, when you hook up a solar panel to your house, um, the, the, the meter doesn't need to really register that as a solar panel per se. All, all, the, all the net meter really sees is that more power is flowing out of your house and into the grid. So if you, over a 15 minute period of time, produce more power from like your solar panel than you consume, that means your net meter is, get, is gonna read um, like a positive value. And that means that you're gonna actually get paid for that 15 minute period rather than 
um, having to pay for electricity. So all this really comes down to is is accounting. Um, and Grid Plus is kind of like the global accounting layer. So we we want to be we want to be basically the bridge between um, this future that we see of distributed ener- energy resources um, as kind of their own local grid, sort of like local production. Um, we want to be the bridge between that and the old world of, of electricity retailing and, and things like that. So what we want to um, sort of facilitate in, in, the, in the long term is peer-to-peer transfers. Um, so if, for example, Alice produces five kilowatt hours of power and then Bob consumes that five kilowatt hours of power, if Alice is offering a better rate for that power than we are as a provider, um, on our system, Bob will be able to purchase that directly from Alice. And again, that's that's really where um, blockchain comes into play. That's that's where um, you kind of need something like the Raiden network on Ethereum to facilitate that payment layer. Um, yeah, over sense. time, yeah, o- o- over time, we think that the grid will will localize for the most part. Like the the shift from the shift of generation will will go away from the larger upstream, you know coal-fired power plants. I I, I don't think, well, I I don't know that it will ever completely disappear, but I think a lot of that, um, a lot of that supply will be shifted to local producers because they don't have to move power over long distances. And it's in many cases cheaper on a per unit basis to produce it locally. That's great. So, all right, the last last couple of questions. Uh, This this sounds like it'd be a really great system once it gets going. And I'm sure Instead of having to manually go and look for the cheapest power or for inefficiencies in the system, you know, it'll just automatically do that. Mat- have a matching network, you know, for buyers and sellers of power locally. Um, what do you guys have on your roadmap for the next six months or a year? You know, what's coming and you know, what are some milestones? Yeah, so I think we are going to be pretty focused on getting this first um, – this first pilot out there in Texas and, and sort of getting the 5,000 customers so that we have a small amount of scale um, and really proving out this model that this works. Um, we're also working on partnerships with other utilities. Um, we have one that will probably be announced pretty shortly here. Um, and we want the idea there is that we want to be able to license this software to utilities in other regions where we can't operate. So, so Carl talked about Texas being a deregulated market. Um, this, this means essentially that the, the, the retailer cannot own the, the lines of distribution. Um, in, a lot of, in a lot of cases, in a lot of states, in the U.S. and really throughout the world, you don't see that. You, you have these kind of government sanctioned monopolies. Um, and we would never be able to operate there unless unless like a lot of legislation was changed. So we want to be able to work with utilities that already operate there um, who see a benefit in sort of the automation that our software provides and then the cost cutting that our software provides. Um, And we want to be able to bring Grid Plus to those areas as well. That's great. All right. So last question, how can people uh, get in touch with you if they want to talk about collaborating and finding out more about, uh, you know, what you guys do? Yeah, go to go to gridplus.io, uh, join our Slack, and then find either myself, Carl, or Mark D'Agostino um, on the Slack there, and then just just give us give us a holler. All right, well that's great. Well, guys, thanks for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. The Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Blockchain Super Conference is coming to Dallas, Texas, February 16, 17, and 18 in 2018. If you know of a better way to get the latest insider knowledge about crypto, to hear directly from the top minds in this field, to interact personally with 800 fellow crypto lovers, hodlers, investors, miners, traders, developers, and founders, then I'd like to hear about it. If you don't, then you don't want to miss out. Register today for the Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Blockchain Super Conference. Go to BitcoinSuperConference.com and register today as a super early bird to get the lowest rates on tickets and hotel rooms. That's BitcoinSuperConference.com. You have been listening to Almost Here, Around the Corner Future Technology Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Subscribe to this podcast, post a review, to discover more future technologies that are poised to transform our lives for better or worse, such as Bitcoin, artificial intelligence, 
3D printing, blockchain, virtual reality, and more.